This is CBC Here and Now. Business owners are trying to get back on their feet after a devastating fire in paradise over the weekend. I'll bring you more of that story coming up on Here and Now. This is Sheila O'Leary saying where she is running, and I'd love it if she would choose another place to run. Provincial politics gets back in action with the conflict inside the NDP. In St. John's Deputy Mayor Sheila O'Leary will try to defeat party stalwart Lorraine Michael for the nomination in Signal Hill Kitty Vitty. And inclusion for women, but not if they're in opposition. Three female MHAs question why they weren't invited to a conference on women in leadership. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Business owners are trying to get back on their feet after a devastating fire in paradise over the weekend. Flames tore through Neal's Pond Plaza Saturday afternoon, gutting multiple shops. Here and Now's Meg Roberts joins us live from that location. Well, Meg, it doesn't look as though there's much of that left there at the plaza there. Yeah, well, as you can see behind me, the majority of the roof has collapsed. All of the windows have been shattered and the building is covered in black char. Now, I was on the scene Saturday afternoon and I kept hearing the same thing. People were so surprised at how quickly the building burnt down to the ground. Now, obviously, this has been heartbreaking for residents and especially business owners. But I spoke with some of them today and they say they're ready to turn a bad situation into a fresh start. Where you can see that the uh, roof is collapsed. That right there is the door that I came out of. Nathan Mitchell was working at a shop in Neal's Pond Plaza when he noticed smoke billowing out of the right side of the mall. Without thinking, he immediately ran into several businesses trying to alert them of the fire. Being a resident of Paradise and someone who works in the mall, he says the situation is devastating. A lot of these smaller places are just, there's a lot of employees out of work. So I just really felt bad for them. It's kind of a heartbreaking situation. Definitely, especially for the town of Paradise. I mean, there's a seven businesses now that are gone. The adult store wasn't even open to the public yet, and its owners hadn't gotten around to signing their insurance papers. Now they're stuck with thousands of dollars in lost goods. Karen Atwood, the owner of the Math and English Academy, says she went numb when she got the news. She's thankful no students or teachers were in the building, but she says it's hard not to get emotional over the loss. My emails and my phone just started calls from families, calls from my sister, calls from friends, and um, that's how I heard about it. I, uh, I was in shock. I really was. I didn't believe it. Even when I looked at it, I said, oh, they can save some of that. <laughs> it's not going to be a loss, and like, just in complete denial. Today, Atwood isn't in denial. She's working hard to get her business back up and running. We will be here and we will rebuild and uh, we will be in the same area and I, I look forward to a new beginning as hard as this is. Um, I, I can see it uh, being a new start. It's important to note that no one was injured in this fire, thankfully. Now, we spoke to police. They say, as of right now, the investigation is ongoing, but it does not appear suspicious at this point. Uh, it's unclear as to what the cause of the fire is and how much damage it has done. Reporting live in Paradise, I'm Meg Roberts for Here and Now. Well, I can't imagine fighting fires in these temperatures. These were your uh, morning lows and overnight overnight lows and morning temperatures this morning. Uh, sitting around minus 17 in Badger, minus 13 in Cornerbrook. St. John's was sitting at minus 8 this morning. Those temperatures warmed up quite nicely into the afternoon, reaching uh, about minus 4 in St. John's. Similar uh, temperatures for Gander at minus 3, Badger at 0 degrees. And then we've got warm temperatures through Labrador as well. Minus 8 was the afternoon high in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now, taking a look at the satellite radar, we are starting to see our next system make its way Seeing some snow right now. These temperatures are going to climb as we head through the night tonight. Here's a look at the st uh, system timeline for St. John's in the metro area. We'll see about 5 to 10 centimeters of snow and ice pellets by the time midnight rolls around tonight. Change over to potentially some freezing rain and then over to rain by morning with those temperatures sitting around 4 degrees. We're going to see those winds climb as or winds uh, get stronger as well, about 100 kilometers per hour. We've got a number of warnings across the province. I'll have all the forecast details when I I come back. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, hundreds of people were at Supreme Court in St. John's today for jury selection as the trial begins for a carbineer man accused of killing his own child. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. 
It was one of the largest jury pools in Newfoundland and Labrador's history. More than 1,200 people were summoned here today to Supreme Court to appear for jury duty. At 9.30 this morning, hundreds of people were arriving here at Supreme Court, sometimes lining up right onto the street. The accused, Trent Butt, was also in the courtroom as jurors were selected. He watched silently, showing no emotion, as they streamed in. Five-year-old Quinn Butt was found dead on April 24, 2016. Days later, Trent Butt was charged with first-degree murder and arson. He has pleaded not guilty to both charges. Quinn Butt's mother, Andrea Goss, was also in court today. She followed closely as jurors were excluded and selected. Goss and Butt were estranged at the time of the fire. The bank that held the mortgage on Trent Butt's fire-damaged home had it demolished 10 months afterwards. Butt's trial was originally set to begin in March 2018, but three days before it started, Butt told the court he had fired his lawyers. He is now represented in court by defense lawyer Derek Hogan. He's been in custody since his arrest in 2016. And that's here now as Mark Quinn reporting from St. John's. Now, when court adjourned late this afternoon, 210 potential jurors remained. The process of choosing 12 of those people for Trent Butt's murder trial will continue tomorrow morning. Lawyers for Al Potter and the Crown made final arguments this afternoon at his first degree murder trial. And it was the last chance for both sides to sway the jury. Is Al Potter guilty of plotting to kill Dale Porter, then lying to the jury about it? Or did he defend himself in a knife fight? Ariana Kellen is live now from our newsroom with more details on this. Ariana has been covering this court case for its entirety. Ariana, what was said in testimony today? Well, Anthony, for the defense, this was the first time they got to directly address the jury. And the message from defense lawyer Randy Piercy was this, that Al Potter had no other choice but to stab Dale Porter and that there was no shred of evidence to suggest anything but self-defense. He also took aim at a police agent. There are two in, these, in this case. This man made nearly half a million dollars and still could not get a confession from Al Potter. Now, Potter's story is that he defended himself and a friend from a knife-wielding Dale Porter in North River five years ago. Piercy says Potter was strong and consistent during his two days on the stand. As for the first police agent who said Potter confessed to him that he buddied up to Porter then killed him, the defense says not to listen to him, that his evidence was not credible. Now, is there bad character evidence about Potter, his lifestyle and criminal activity? Yes. And did it sound at times more like a novel than a trial? Yes. But Piercy says all that needs to be ignored and the jury needs to look at the charge at hand. The Crown says to the contrary, there is reason to believe that police agent and his story of a confession because there is other evidence to back it up. Now, Sheldon Steve says Potter's explanation as to why he pulled the knife first was baffling and asked the jury who quiets down an argument with a knife. Now, planned or deliberate or merely an act of self-defense, the jury will tackle those issues tomorrow after hearing instructions from the judge. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland. Well, to Labrador now, several businesses in Happy Valley Goose Bay were destroyed this weekend after a fire ripped through a local mall. And as those embers continue to smolder, shop owners are left to figure out just what to do next. Here now's Jacob Barker was at the scene of last night's fire where he has returned to now. So Jacob, what have you learned? It was all hands on deck yesterday. A volunteer town crew worked alongside a crew from the military base to extinguish the massive flames. Pumps at the neighboring gas station were turned off. Keeping the fire contained was crucial. The building was an afterthought. We knew we had to put the fire out, but we had to protect uh, Woodward's uh, gas station. Flare-ups today had crews coming back several times. Volunteers, town staff, everybody here is putting in, uh, in the hours. I'm heartbroken. Seamstress April Williams had her shop in the strip mall. Machines, material, personal items all lost and not just her own. Where my customers are concerned because my customers had stuff in my store that's been lost. You know, there's girls with their prom dresses. Williams has insurance, but today she faces the daunting task of starting over from scratch. Renting commercial property in Goose Bay is very expensive. And, uh, you know, and there's 
limited spaces available. So I'm right at this moment, I really don't know where to go from here. This is the first time that I've been here since I heard about the fire yesterday. Realtor Karen Pomeroy can work from home until she finds a new spot, but decorations for an upcoming fundraiser for a local women's shelter destroyed. The Royal Masquerade Ball was definitely a fundraiser for Libra House. So we'll have to see where we go to for this year. It's six weeks away and right now we have nothing for it. <laughs> a bit of disbelief. Uh, I just couldn't believe the magnitude of the blaze. And building owner Peter Woodward stood by and watched as the building he owned for 42 years burned to the ground. He's thankful the firefighters managed to save his neighboring business, a convenience shop and gas station. It would have been a much worse situation if it hadn't been for them. Woodward is planning to rebuild, but now his thoughts have turned to the people who've lost their jobs. I feel mostly for the employees that had jobs in the building. There was about 30 people employed in the building, so you know they've all woken up this morning wondering what they're going to do with respect to finding employment and things like that, I would presume anyway. Horrible fire over the weekend. Maybe some of you actually checked out uh, Jacob on social media and his reports. I mean, just a terrible, terrible event in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And no doubt uh, Jacob will have many follow-ups to this in the coming days on Here and Now. Well, to Ottawa now, the House of Assembly have reopened today, but the big story was on Parliament Hill. Dramatic developments in the wake of the SNC-Lavalin affair. Another federal cabinet minister has quit. Treasury Board President Jane Philpott has decided to resign. She was at a public event in Ottawa this morning. This just hours before she dropped a political bombshell on Twitter. And it's her statement that's raising eyebrows. She made it clear that her decision was because of the SNC case, saying, quote, Sadly, I have lost confidence in how the government has dealt with this matter and in how it has responded to the issues raised. And she goes on to say there can be a cost to acting on one's principles, but there is a bigger cost to abandoning them. She also said she plans to stay on as a Liberal MP. Now, Phil Pot is close friends with former Attorney General at the centre of the SNC-Lavalin affair. Jody Wilson-Raybould's allegations of political interference in a criminal case involving the Quebec engineering firm have rocked the Trudeau government, and she, too, is staying on as a Liberal MP. Well, back in this province, criticism of a women's conference organized by the provincial government in St. John's continues this week. Some women walked out of the summit last week after a male presented networking advice from a program dating back to the 1930s. It included tips like smile more and pray to conquer worry. The minister responsible for status of women apologized for that session, but says overall the conference was a success. Today in the House of Assembly, opposition members asked why they weren't invited. This was not a conference on women's leadership, but a hastily organized PR event for the Premier and the new minister. I asked the Order. Premier... Mr. Speaker, I asked the Premier, why did he invite all these women leaders and change makers from around the province but leave absolutely no time to hear from them and for meaningful work? Minister, why did you only invite the female members of the Liberal Caucus and exclude all other female leaders in the House of Assembly from this conference? Was this intentional or was it a mistake? Now, in about 35 minutes, we will revisit this story and hear from the minister, Carol Ann Haley, who's responding to the criticism. Well, a date hasn't been set yet for the provincial election, but already there's a fight over one long-held seat. Sheila O'Leary is gunning for Lorraine Michael's spot as the NDP option for voters in St. John's East Kitty Vitty. Michael was first elected MHA 13 years ago, and she intends to run again. Here now is Katie Breen is in the newsroom tonight, so Katie... What does O'Leary have to say? Well, O'Leary says St. John's East Kitty Vitty is home and it's where she wants to run. She's currently the deputy mayor of St. John's and she feels she's at the prime of her career to make that leap to provincial politics. She feels the provincial NDP is kind of stagnant right now and that the party needs some new blood. I believe democracy is a fantastic tool and I think it's really important and I think a strong race, a contested race like this, will be something that's very positive for the party. I think it stimulates, it causes excitement and I'm just happy to be living in a democratic society where we can actually take that chance and, and go out there. Uh, no matter where the chips fall, uh, I will have the greatest respect for Lorraine always. She's done incredible work for the party and uh, all you can do is offer yourself. It's quite the story developing here. So, Katie, what does Lorraine Michael have to say about that? Well, she wishes that O'Leary would just pick a different district to run in. 
Of course, Michael earned her seat in 2006. She went on to be the leader of the NDP, and she feels she's not done work in her, she's not finished working, rather, in her area. This is what she asked, this is what she said, rather, when asked, why not just step aside? But why do it? If we have, you know, we just can't have all new blood. It's not bad having one person with experience in there. Not bad at all. So why should I do it? Why, you know, why would somebody say to me, you've been there long enough? I actually think that that, you know, smells of ageism. Uh, and if people are saying that, that would really upset me if I thought people were thinking that. Tomorrow, the NDP is going to announce its new leader. Michael says she has considered letting the new leader run in her district, but she says she will not be stepping aside for O'Leary. Reporting live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. now Katie, of course, will be at that news conference about the leadership of the NDP, so make sure to tune to Here and Now for more political coverage. Staying with the public service, at least in politics, no raises and no more severance. The provincial government has struck a tentative deal with the Newfoundland and Labrador Teachers Association after almost two years of bargaining. Union President Dean Ingram admits those concessions aren't going over well with all of the province's 6,000 teachers, but he says this agreement was the best the association could hope for in the current economic climate. The government says teacher severance will be paid out and that payouts across the civil service will save the province about $25 million a year. Some of these things may be allowed into Canada. It's best that the traveller find out before they bring it into the country. A warning for sun seekers heading south this season, leave that alligator head where you found it. More tips on exotic souvenirs coming up.
Their update is brought to you by 811 Healthline. Medical advice, health information, mental health, and healthy eating. Dial 811. It's free and confidential. Well, look what the Arctic cat Yay. brought home. <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> Thank you. It's yeah. been about a week, yeah? Mm -hmm. Good to have well, you back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You missed a lot of wild weather. I did, apparently. Oh, did you ever? Oh, a lot of to, wind. I was trying to stay off Twitter, but <laughs> yeah. it's hard when no, you see the weather. Yeah. yeah. And so you, you got in last night. I did. Airport, I did. What, what did you see at the mm -hmm. airport? Well, this was the scene at the airport uh, last night. More than 100 young athletes returned from the Canada Games in Red Deer. Nice. Newfoundland Labrador brought home two medals. Melanie Taylor won gold in Special Olympics figure skating. And Emma Mullet won bronze in judo. Yeah, and congratulations to them as well as everybody else uh, who competed. And uh, I'm glad you were there to actually catch that. Yeah. I should really yeah. appreciate that. Well, it was kind of funny coming down the stairs and everybody was clapping. <laughs> no, 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 really. I'm just here for the weather. Yeah, no, it was awesome. It was so nice to see. It actually was really heartwarming. Nice. Yeah, well, just to welcome them all back. Oh. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And we welcome them back to uh, another storm. Oh, great. Uh oh. <laughs> great. Yes. Yeah, if we take a look at the current temperatures right now, uh, dropped a little bit from what we saw today. So back down to the minus single digits in St. John's, minus six, minus two in Badger right now. And those temperatures sitting uh, just below about minus 11 for Lab City right now. Now, taking a look at the satellite radar, you can see the snow is starting to make its way. Next up will be uh, the Avalon. We'll start to see that within the next hour or so. And eventually, uh, things will change over overnight tonight. But here's a look at the current watches and warnings right now. Wind warnings along the south coast, northern peninsula, east, Avalon, Buren Peninsula, as well as uh, Bonavista. The wreck house area could see gusts in excess of 160 kilometers per hour as we head through the night tonight. Otherwise, we're looking at south winds near 100 kilometers per hour. Snowfall warning for the interior up through the Bayvert Peninsula. Snowfall warning, uh, rather 15 to 20 centimeters of snow is expected. And then a freezing rain warning for uh, Buren Peninsula as well as the Avalon. I'm thinking it's going to be more of an ice pellet uh, setup as we head through the night tonight, but we are still looking at that risk of extended periods of freezing rain and a winter uh, storm warning for the Port of Port Peninsula. Now, taking a look at the future tracker, we can see all that snow start to make its way in overnight with that mixing. That's what uh, that purple is there or that pink rather and then everything will change over to rain in behind that things should generally clear out across the island but we are still looking at that potential for some onshore flurries along the west coast and then the storm starts to hit uh, the uh, Labrador coast this is where we have uh, a couple of watches and warnings in there for Tuesday. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. But here's a look at what we're expecting overnight tonight. Good 10 to potentially 20 centimeters of snow and ice pellet for most of central portions of the island as well as the west coast up through the northern peninsula. And then the southeast coast of Labrador, we're looking at about 10 to 15 centimeters. Same for uh, the northeast coast as well as Clarenville. But then you'll see a little bit of mixture with those ice pellets for uh, the Buren Peninsula as well as the Avalon about five to ten centimeters overnight tonight by about midnight and then we'll start to see that potential for some freezing rain uh, by the time the morning rolls around. Those temperatures are going to climb though and here's what you're going to see by morning. So about four degrees for St. John's, same for Marystown. That's why everything should change over to rain and then uh, parts of central hovering around the zero degree mark and then along the west coast minus one for corner brook overnight tonight port basque sitting around my two degrees so you're going to see a change over as well otherwise windy conditions again rec house area seeing gusts upwards of about 160 kilometers per hour overnight tonight and then uh, tomorrow or rather uh, about five to ten centimeters for cartwright now through tomorrow things should generally clear out we are looking at that uh, potential for some flurries along the west coast and then we've got the storm uh, warnings up through Labrador. So Makovic and um, Hopedale looking at a blizzard warning. And then Nain and Rigolette under a blowing snow advisory. And then into the afternoon tomorrow, those temperatures are going to climb quite nicely to about mine, or rather drop into the afternoon to about the minus single digits. But with those clearing skies not looking too bad. Just windy conditions across the board, those onshore flurries along the west coast and then up through uh, Labrador. We're going to hang on to that potential for some blizzard conditions. So looking ahead, we uh, got a couple more systems on the way, but I'll have all those details coming up. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. 
Well, if you're planning a sunny vacation this season, you might want to think ahead about your souvenirs. A lot of wooden trinkets from the Caribbean are not allowed in this country. They're among the items regularly seized by the Canada Border Services Agency in St. John's. Here now's Ariana Kelland has more on what you can't bring back. We all know there are rules for air travel. No smoking on the plane, no liquids on your carry-on, and no bringing endangered, dead alligator heads to Canada. Oh, you didn't know about that one? These here are endangered species, um, so they are not allowed in to Canada. So that's a taxidermy turtle, yes, right? Yes, and a lizard. So some of these things may be allowed in to Canada, it's best that the traveler find out before they bring it into the country. If a dehydrated alligator head for a coffee table piece is your thing, you may want to rethink your decor. Bringing an endangered species into Canada could mean facing a fine. And jewelry like this bracelet seems fine, right? But it's made of prohibited materials like coral, elephant hair and ivory. To the average person, it's just a necklace. But oftentimes, vendors will try to entice you to buy it by telling you that it's coral. Mm -hmm. So it would be best for the traveler, again, to make sure that they're informed, to know whether or not they can bring that back. I asked about the weirdest item Urschler has ever seen, but she says she doesn't think about what's weird, but about what's dangerous or harmful. We are very careful with wood products. The wood products, is the varnish side is not so much of an issue, but it's the raw wood inside. This is where bugs like to live. Most of these bugs are not native to Canada, and they can do a lot of harm to our ecosystem, our environment. Also on this one, this is the eyes here are jacarity beans. These are used very often for decoration on toys and ornaments like this, and those are poisonous. One of these beans, normally used as the eyes on wooden animals, can kill a small child, she says. And if you're still unsure, magnets always make good souvenirs. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. The St. John's Cancer Center is struggling to keep up with the growing number of patients, but as Cease Hair reports, staff hope that a new campaign with a personal spin will help create additional and much needed space. It's busy inside the walls of the Bliss Murphy Center due to high demand for cancer treatment. And in the next seven years or so, cancer rates are expected to jump 40%. That means a new chemotherapy unit is needed. It's 30 years old. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing the job that's done there. And kudos to the staff because they're absolutely fabulous and they do really, really good things. The space is becoming a limiting factor for them. But to build it, we have to come together. Like never before. Because at the end of the day, we're, we're in this, this together. together. And that's the name of this campaign. In This Together aims to raise $5 million for a new chemotherapy unit. And a key component of the campaign is having cancer survivors tell their stories themselves. I think that she's helped me just overcome the fear of cancer. The goal, a new state-of-the-art unit on the top floor of the new nuclear medicine facility. It'll have its own in-house pharmacy, which means no more lugging the drugs around the premises. And at triple the size, there'll be more privacy for exams and consults, ultimately a better place for patients and their families. It's not a great experience, obviously, to have to go and do this, but we want to make sure that people are as, as, as comfortable and, and, and relaxed as they possibly can be and that our loved ones can support them when they're going through this. And this new chemo unit will do all of that in spades. Organizers of the campaign hope to have the money raised by the end of this calendar year. To make a donation, visit their website, inthistogethernl.ca, or call the Bliss Murphy Cancer Care Foundation. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. If you have the right wins, 
and the right cold temperatures, you will see a lot of ice forming. Seeing red and lots of it, the province's coastline is slowly becoming choked with pack ice. I dropped by Coast Guard offices today to find out just how much there is. We'll have that story up next. Welcome back. Well, the province's coastlines are jam-packed with ice and it's wreaking havoc with offshore travel. The combination of unfavorable winds and cold temperatures have caused the ice to squeeze into the shorelines and that means the Coast Guard's icebreakers are working overtime. Today I stopped by the Rock or Regional Operations Center to find out if this year's buildup of ice is out of the ordinary. What are we looking at here? So this is the uh, ice concentrations uh, over the last four years uh, from 2016 to 2019. What we see here is uh, the con conditions at this date range in 2016. And uh, as you can see, there's not a lot in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There's a little bit off the Labrador and off uh, northeast coast of Newfoundland, but nothing down on Fogo, nothing here off St. John's. So all of this is ice. Yes, everything uh, dark red is higher concentration. Uh, you see the uh, various uh, colors, which means just it's just varying concentrations. Mm -hmm. And 2017, uh, we see just about the same as the year before. Then we jump to 2018, where we see a big jump up in ice concentration last year. 
And then this year, for 2019, you can see a major jump up again, whereas the Gulf is full, northeast coast is full, and it's just off St. John's. And it's all densely packed ice as well. It's pretty big stuff in there, yeah. It's causing a bit of trouble for ferries and commercial vessels. So how unusual is this when compared to past years? So we're above the 30-year average for ice concentrations. Uh, it's a median average that Environment Canada sets by looking at the last 30 years, where the ice was, how much, and they compare it year to year. So we are above that 30 year, which is unusual given that we've seen a downward trend over the last two decades. And what causes that? It's just a function of uh, temperature and wind. Uh, if you have the right winds and the right cold temperatures, you will see a lot of ice forming. If the wind is onshore and high, it'll beat a lot of it up. But uh, right this year, it's just been perfect for feeding into the stream. So what kind of complications does this create? So it makes it busy. Our, uh, so far we have uh, uh, six icebreakers working today. So we've been escorting ferries, uh, commercial ships, fishing vessels, uh, anything that's moving here lately in and out of the Gulf, we've been helping them. But a lot of boats can go on their own. But when they do get stuck, we get the call. And I guess with the ferries, it's a lot of people relying on the ferries. This ice must be causing a lot of problems in that regard. Yes, so we're escorting the full Guana ferry just about every morning now. Um, the Bell Island Ferry, we've been up there a lot, you know, helping them when they can run. Mm -hmm. The Magdalen Islands Ferry as well. And so far we haven't had to do anything with Marine Atlantic, but we're waiting to see. That's taken right from the, that's the captain of the icebreaker uh, taking video as he's moving through the ice. That would be an example of densely packed ice. That's hard stuff there, yeah. You see the snow on top there, that makes it really sticky. This causes a lot of friction on the hull, which slows the, even the icebreakers down. And you can see here, mm -hmm. this is the Henry Larson in some more stuff, but you see all these air bubbles here. Mm -hmm. So this is the Henry Larson escorting with her, what we call the bubbler system activated. It shoots compressed air out at the ice, reducing friction and also pushes the ice. So it, it helps people to follow us and it reduces friction on the hull of a Coast Guard boat, which makes it go easier in ice. How long is this going to last? It all depends on the temperature and wind. <laughs> <laughs> we can see ice off the east coast and northeast coast of Newfoundland until May or June. Okay. It all depends on the wind. Right. If the winds go the right way, it can all go away. But if it persists and stays northerly, we'll see it for a long while. So I guess all the ferry operators and fish harvesters have the Coast Guard on speed dial right now. <laughs> they know our number, <laughs> for sure. Women were rightfully frustrated and angry. This was not a conference on women's leadership, but a hastily organized PR event. The House of Assembly remain opens to some pointed questions for the Premier about last week's controversial women and leadership conference. We'll take you to the legislature for a little gender politics next.
Welcome back to the House of Assembly now, where some fiery questions from outgoing NDP leader Jerry Rogers came on behalf of the three women on the opposition benches. She wants to know why non-liberal MHAs were not invited to last week's conference on women and leadership. Mr. Speaker, women were invited on short notice and no travel assistance was given to women from outside St. John's. He knows how desperate women's organizations are for funding for their life-saving work. He invited his Liberal colleagues, but not myself nor women colleagues in, in opposition. I asked the Premier, how much of taxpayers' money did he spend on his personal partisan PR event? Well, Caroline Haley, the minister responsible for the status of women, says last week's gathering wasn't perfect, but it was the first of its kind and it was a major success. When reporters asked her why she did not invite the women who sit across from her in the legislature, the minister wasn't entirely clear. Uh, Ms. Haley, why wouldn't you invite female colleagues in the opposition benches to that leadership conference last week? That's not totally accurate. This was not an exclusive event. Uh, uh, invitations went out to a variety of, of community contacts and asking them to distribute uh, to their networks. And I would have assumed that given the context that they have in the, those networks, I would have assumed that they would have been passed along the invitation. But female members of the Liberal Caucus were invited, were they not? Yes, they were. So why would you invite female Liberals but not female New Democrats or Tories? I mean, we always talk about the exclusion of women, and here you are excluding women. No, I don't think that's accurate. As I said, this was not an exclusive event. Uh, you know, it was a first-come, first-served basis. The invita invitation was out on Twitter and to various uh, extensive contact, community contacts, and I believe that if they were, you know, if they uh, had such a, a, a I guess a relationship with the uh, with their networks, then they would have received the invitation from that in that way. Yeah. Was, there, was there registration? Because there seemed to be some confusion. Some people were saying they were invited to this, and other people saying there was a registration process. Which, which was it? The email and the invitation that went out uh, did have a registration attached to it, but it was free to, uh, to attend. What is your response to Jerry Rogers' comments that the whole conference was hastily organized and just a PR stunt by or the Premier, sorry, and yourself? I disagree. I think this was a very positive day. In fact, we had uh, more than 350 people uh, in attendance from diverse backgrounds, and I believe that uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, it was a lot of positive outcomes that came out of this, uh, this conference. I just want to clarify something, Minister. In your answer, you said that you hoped or would assume that women's networks would make this conference known to members of the opposition. Why wouldn't that also apply to your Liberal colleagues? I mean, why invite people who remember your caucus but not in the opposition? I, st I still don't square that. I, I don't get it. As I've said, this was not an exclusive event. I reached out to uh, the opposition members. In fact, with one of them, I did meet. The second one, I asked for a meeting prior to the leadership conference, and I didn't get a response. That's a totally different answer. That's the answer. Okay, so they snubbed you. They did. No, I didn't say that. Well, your first answer was you put it out there and they should have learned from Twitter. Now you're saying you met with them and they didn't want to go. I which said I met with one of the opposition members and I made her aware of the uh, leadership conference. Uh, the second one, I did reach out for a meeting and I didn't get a response. That was prior to the leadership conference. And you don't want to name them? No, I don't. Well, to British Columbia now, where one woman has been told she can no longer teach at a Christian school. And this after moving in with her boyfriend. Now she's questioning government's funding of religious schools, schools that are legally allowed to discriminate against employees and are allowed religious exemptions from human rights laws. Erica Johnson has the details. So that's right in your contract. Yeah. Stephanie Vanderkratz lost her teaching job of 14 years because of a clause in her employment contract. The contract at the Surrey Christian School says all employees must follow Christian values outlined in a community standards policy, including a clause saying employees must abstain from any sexual activity outside of a heterosexual marriage. Vanderkratz had just moved in with her boyfriend. The impact on me has been enormous, so professionally, personally, for my family, and it's, um, it, is, it continues to hurt. 
Surrey Christian School is one of hundreds of religious schools across the country that receive public funding. Many are allowed to have controversial employment policies because they have exemptions from human rights law to protect religious freedoms. I, I don't think it's discriminatory because it's not a requirement for people to work here. There's nothing to hide. It's, it's what the beliefs and traditions and values of this particular community are about. And um, so we're trying to be consistent. Last year, the B.C. government gave Surrey Christian and other faith-based schools a total of almost $300 million. This education advocate says taxpayer dollars shouldn't support schools where teachers lose their jobs based on gender identity, sexual orientation or marital status. I think that is offensive to most British Columbians and, and Canadians that you could be discriminated against and perhaps lose your job because of that. As societal views change, governments may rethink public funding of such schools, says this human rights lawyer. If those are schools that are getting public funding, that's something that our taxpayer money is going to, and I think people are right to query, is that, is that something we still want to see um, in this day and age? Go Public asked the B.C. government why it funds schools with controversial contracts. No one from the Premier's office nor the Ministry of Education would address that question. Meantime, the Alberta government is reviewing the contracts from all of its Catholic school boards after a former principal said she felt forced to quit because of her sexual orientation. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. NHL Hall of Famer Ted Lindsay has died. Lindsay is best known for the years that he played with the Detroit Red Wings as a member of the mighty production line of the 1950s. He spent a total of 17 years in the league, including a three-year stint in Chicago. And his aggressive, no-holds-barred style earned him the nickname Terrible Ted. He flicked it to the corner. And Gordie Howe's pass out sets up Lindsay, who scores from close in. Now, Lindsay was born in Renfrew, Ontario in 1925, and he was the youngest of nine children. He entered the NHL when he was signed by the Red Wings at 19 years of age. And even by the standards of the day, Lindsay was considered small, just 5 foot 8 and 160 pounds. But he made a name for himself as a hardworking and skilled player who knew how to antagonize his opponents. He also antagonized the NHL. In the late 1950s, he launched an antitrust suit against the league as part of a failed effort to establish a players association. The association was eventually established in 1967. Ted Lindsay died in hospice care in suburban Detroit this morning. He was 93 years old. <laughs> Tomorrow on Here and Now, they are a great musical duo, but Julia Halfyard and Doug Angel first met when he operated on her thyroid. A scary procedure for any patient, but especially for a singer. I'm singing well, I'm singing, I feel like at the top of my game, and uh, I feel very, very fortunate actually to have had some, uh, such, a, such a skilled surgeon, but such a compassionate person uh, minding my, my journey. Yeah, Dr. Angel, no less.
the business that began with one little girl and one orphan duck. A sure thing, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Well, we have uh, some messy weather to get through in the near future, but how's it looking in the long range? Yeah, so Labrador is in for the same system that's moving through Newfoundland is going to park itself off the coast of Labrador, and that means uh, some strong winds and blizzard conditions. So if we take a look at the forecast into overnight uh, Tuesday into Wednesday, you can see that system just off the coast of Labrador and it's going to continue uh, to see those strong winds with it and then some more snow will push in as well through the afternoon on Wednesday and then down through parts of the Buren Peninsula as well as the Avalon. Another little system skirts by which means we could see some more snow through uh, the evening hours and then again into Thursday or by the time the morning rolls around, we'll see some more snow move in and continue to see that up through Labrador. So as far as snowfall amounts go, this will take us from tonight all the way through to Wednesday night. You can see uh, widespread areas of between 20 to uh, 30 centimeters, could see as much as 40 centimeters for parts of Makovic up through Hopedale as well. Otherwise, we're looking at about 10 to 15 centimeters through Happy Valley Goose Bay, less as we head towards uh, Western Labrador. About two centimeters is on tap for Lab City. Now taking a look at the forecast, those temperatures are going to stay in the minus teens for the most part for Lab City, minus 19, minus 14 for Happy Valley Goose Bay through the day on Wednesday. A little bit warmer up through Nain with that snow and blowing snow continuing through the day, minus 7, and then some sunshine for Cartwright and minus 10. Otherwise, we're looking at temperatures back down uh, to the minus single digits right across the island with that potential for some flurries. More sun and cloud for parts of central, but still can't rule out that chance of flurries. And then that light snow for uh, the Beeren Peninsula as well as the Avalon. Now looking ahead, we're going to continue to see this messy weather right through the day on uh, Thursday up through Labrador with those strong winds. Again, these lines, the tighter they are together, the stronger the winds. And then across uh, Newfoundland, Things will generally clear out. We're still looking at the potential for some onshore flurries, though, down along the south coast, Beeren Peninsula, and then uh, through the overnight as well. Into Friday, we'll continue to see that onshore flurry activity through most of uh, the west and south coast right through the day on Friday. And then again into Saturday as we continue to see that northwesterly flow right across the board. So uh, taking a look at the next five days for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland, the clearing skies tomorrow so doesn't look too bad. Those temperatures are going to drop down to about minus two. You'll start off at about four degrees in the morning and then sitting around minus eight by the time Thursday rolls around with that potential for some flurries and then that chance of flurries for Friday as well. Same thing for central Newfoundland. Temperatures a little bit cooler though, but minus 10 by the time Thursday rolls around. Western Newfoundland looks generally gray and then those cooler temperatures as well with that potential for onshore flurries. Some windy conditions expected tomorrow and then eastern Labrador about two to four centimeters for Happy Valley Goose Bay towards the coast. That will be more with those blizzard conditions and then we're looking at uh, western Labrador sitting in the minus teens right across the board with uh, sunshine. It looks like for Thursday. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, weather caused catastrophic damage in rural Alabama. Search and rescue teams are combing through wreckage looking for survivors after the southeastern state was ravaged by tornadoes. Not seen this type of uh, level of destruction uh, ever in, in uh, my experience here in, in Lee County. Uh, and that covers a span back, I know, for at least 50 years. At least 23 people were killed in the area hardest hit by Sunday's deadly twisters. Dozens more were sent to hospital, and officials fear the death toll will rise. Powerful winds flattened homes and shredded power lines. In some places, debris was carried almost a kilometer. American actor Luke Perry has died, his death coming after he suffered a massive stroke. He was 52. Now, he is best known for his role as Dylan McKay on Beverly Hills 90210, the 1990s TV show that propelled him to superstardom and turned him into a teenage heartthrob. Well, Perry recently played the role of the father of the main character on Riverdale, a TV series shot in Vancouver. Now, on Wednesday, Perry was rushed to hospital after suffering that stroke. 
His publicist says Perry died today surrounded by family and friends. Well, Saturday was an absolutely gorgeous day. Take a look at this photo. Pretty a, iconic area. That's a gimme, right? Oh, it is. Yeah. Gorgeous, though. Should we just let the listeners say it? Because everybody here knows it. I agree. Yeah, right. we'll do that. Take a, take a look at this photo, and I'll tell you where it was taken and who took it when we come back. Place your bets. Welcome back. Well, it might not be Friday just yet, but nope. we do have a special birthday message to share. A Montreal woman who survived the Holocaust marked her 100th birthday over the weekend. Olga Perlmutter says being able to celebrate with her family and friends is what truly made this big birthday a special one. And she also shared her secret for a long life. I feel young and restless. I tell you my secret. Very, very hard work. So there you have it. The secret to long life, hard work. Wow, Olga also attributes her longevity to her strength and her family and friends. And she says it's important to always enjoy living. She certainly looks like she's enjoying yep. living there. Fabulous cake. That's Message a beautiful from the queen. Cake. <laughs> she's looking really good. There you go. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's so Great beautiful. Great gathering. Mm -hmm. That's her spirit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so big mystery. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Such yeah. a big mystery. Take a look at that uh, gorgeous shot one more time. That photo, if you couldn't, if you didn't guess, should I say, uh, was just yeah, taken you have to in the arrows. Yeah, yeah, right, St. John's. Beautiful shot there. Thank you so much for uh, to Ann Madden for sending that photo in. Apparently, it was a beautiful day on Saturday it here. It was yeah. actually really nice on Saturday. Gorgeous afternoon. Yeah. So if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca, and I will get them on the show if I can. I'm trying to figure in my head where she's standing right now. Do you know? I don't know. Sure. Anyway, beautiful angle of that. Mm -hmm. uh, nice yeah. colors and all that. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You miss winds like that? A nice icy uh, yeah. vistas? I mean, I saw blue water like that, but uh, just... Slightly 40, warmer? 40 degrees warmer, yes. yeah. Your secret's <laughs> safe with us. You did bring back an alligator head for me, I did, did you? not. No. I tried to warn I you, no not. alligator heads. No, alligator. Yeah. I did not bring That's that so back. Weird. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Good night.